Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> we welcome you to worship this morning at Galloway Presbyterian Church as we worship through this virtual medium. Uh, even though you're there and I'm here, we are still gathering as God's people. And uh, I invite you to begin worship with a moment of silence. Let us join in the call to worship. Come to worship people of God with praises on your lips. We glorify the one who holds our hands when we slip. Come into the presence of the one who calls us into this sacred space and every space where we're at, where the doors to grace are thrown open so all may enter. Come and hear the stories of the one who loves you. We will tell of the joy and of the love, of the peace and of the hope which is ours. The opening hymn is number 464, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. What is our hope? Simply put, it is that God does not give up on us. With such good news, we can dare to bring our prayers to the one who will not cast aside our words or our hearts. Please join me as we pray together, saying, We admit, knowing God, that from plastic cards to websites, from handheld devices to stock options, we are surrounded by a variety of gods who demand our worship. We can all too easily believe that work is our life, that wealth is the reason for our being, and that success is the very air we breathe. Forgive us, God of mercy. You are not found in a computer chip, but in the child who holds our hand. You are not a simple tweet, but the word that can transform our very lives. You are not a disembodied, constantly recalculating voice, but the one who calls us to life through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And may we pray in silence. Despite everything we do, God loves us. This grace is why we can dare to hope. We will witness to this hope in every word we speak, to every person we meet, thanks be to God, we are forgiven. Amen. Our first reading this morning is another reading from the book of Acts, the history of the early church. We're reading verses 22 through 31 of the 17th chapter, and Paul is in the city of Athens and speaking to the people there. 
O strength of the weak, O hope of the lowly, O joy of our hearts, O love of your people, speak to us now through your words. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, <clears throat> so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far, far off from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed the day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Then our psalm for today is the 66th psalm. We're reading verses 8 through 20. Listen. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. He who has kept us among the living and has not let our feet slip. For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid burdens on our backs. You let people ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, yet you have brought us out to a spacious place. I will come into your house with burnt offerings. I will pay you my vows, those that my lips uttered and my mouth promised when I was in trouble. I will offer to you burnt offerings of fatlings <clears throat> with the smoke of the sacrifice of rams. I will make an offering of bulls and goats. Come in here, all you who fear God. And I will tell you what he has done for me. I cried aloud to him, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly God has listened. He has given heed to the words of my prayer. Blessed be God, because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. Our next hymn is hymn number 403, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus All our sins and griefs to bear What a privilege to carry Everything to God in prayer Oh, what peace we often forfeit God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in A friend so faithful Who will all our sorrow share Jesus knows our every weakness Take it to the Lord in prayer
Our letter to the church this morning comes from Paul's, Peter's first letter to the early church. We're reading verses 13 through 22 of the third chapter. He writes to them as well as to us, Now who will harm you if you're eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear and do not be intimidated, but in your hearts sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good if suffering should be God's will than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels and authorities and powers made subject to him. And then our gospel reading for this morning is from... John's Gospel, the 14th chapter, reading verses 15 through 21. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Now let us pray. Now, O Lord, whether through my words or in spite of my words, speak to your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How are you doing today? The days just sometimes seem to get longer and longer, don't they? The days seem to be just replays of what yesterday was like and the day before yesterday. We're trying to learn how to live in these moments, to live through these times, to live through these uncertain circumstances. But is it really anything new? The specific circumstances is new, but we've lived through times like this before, haven't we? I grew up in the church in a time when it's now considered to be the golden age of the American church. The churches were full every Sunday morning. The young people all flocked to church on Sunday night for a youth group, and then we all stayed and packed the church once again for Sunday evening worship. It was a remarkable time in the life of the church. It seemed to be a a remarkable time in the life of our country. Prosperity and success and wealth. And yet, we need to remember the fears that people experienced. I can remember in the second grade when one of my classmates was diagnosed with polio and placed into an iron lung. And until the polio vaccine came along later in the 50s, we all lived through that fear of whenever polio season began, that our friends might contract it, 
we might contract it. We lived with the fears of the possibility of a nuclear attack coming at any moment. The movies and the books and the TV shows were all filled with the possibility of suddenly missiles coming down out of the sky and obliterating everything as we know it. And the few people who survived, well, long before The Walking Dead ever came along, there were movies talking about how people would survive a nuclear holocaust, a nuclear winter. I think of those days. I think of those days because they remind me of the fact that if we look, if we look at the stories in the Bible, if we look at human history, every generation has lived through the sort of days in which we're living. Every generation has had some sort of fear, some sort of nightmare, some sort of illness, a world war, the Spanish flu, the depression, uh, SARS and MERS years ago. Every generation has had to live with some sort of overwhelming tragedy, some sort of overwhelming suffering, and as people of faith struggled with how do we live through such days. Believe it or not, Peter writes to people who are living in the moments we're living in. Yes, he's writing to a people who are suffering. But it's not the normal suffering that the New Testament talks about. It's not the suffering that's coming from the Roman Empire. It's not the Roman authorities who are coming in and trying to destroy the church or taking the people away to persecute them or throw them to the lions in the Colosseum. These are more insidious, more normal sufferings that the people are enduring. And what Peter is really writing about is how do the people then, how do we now deal with the kind of suffering that we're called to do that is for the good of the community, for the good of the whole? What do we do when we're called to suffer for other people? Isn't that what we're being called to do when we're asked to stay at home, when we're asked to isolate ourselves, to quarantine ourselves, to not go out into public as often as we normally did, and if we do go out into public, to wear a mask? Peter writes to people who are being asked to do these kind of things, similar things back then, for the good of the community. And what he says is what we need to hear is that when we do these things, when we make these choices when we wear masks, when we stay inside, when we maintain our distance from other people, when we choose to order our groceries and other supplies online and have them delivered to us. We are really being a blessing to other people in the midst of this unprecedented time in which we are living. We are being blessed and we are a blessing to others because what we're doing is not just for ourselves, but it's for the good of the community. And because we're willing to do this, Peter reminds us that we shouldn't be afraid. We shouldn't fear what other people fear. You know as well as I do that we can get a daily dose, 24 hours a day, seven days a week of fear. Just turn on the TV, go to social media, whatever. Everybody is willing to sell us fear right and left. But Peter says we don't need to fear what other people fear. The one we need to fear, Peter says, is God. And he doesn't mean be afraid of God. When the scripture talks about fearing God, it's not about, well, God's going to smack you over the head if you don't pay attention, if you don't obey. What scripture means when they talk about fearing God is revering God, worshiping God, trusting God, believing that God loves us enough that God wants only our best interest, the best things for us. And, Paul, and Peter says that we respond to the circumstances around us. We respond to the suffering that's going on in our world and in our communities and our neighborhoods, not with silence, but by continuing to live out lives of faith 
continuing to live out lives of grace and hope, continuing to keep an eye on our neighbors and making sure they're okay, keeping an eye on what's going on in the world, continuing to pray for those who are on the front lines in the hospitals, continuing to pray for those people, even those people that we don't know who have been affected by this COVID-19 event, those who have lost loved ones. They're not just a number. They're not just a statistic. They're somebody's mother. They're somebody's brother. They're somebody's father. They're somebody's son. They're somebody that God cares for. And there's somebody that we're called to love and care for and pray for as well. And finally, we are enabled to offer a witness in these times that we are called to sacrifice for the good of the community. We are called not to be afraid and we are called to live out our lives as people of grace, of hope, of faith, of life, and love and we're called to live out the truth the truth that every generation reflected in scripture every generation in human history has understood is that there's circumstances that come that are completely beyond our control and yet we can trust and believe and hope in the one who has our lives in control who is bringing hope and grace and healing to us. God did not will this coronavirus on us. God's will is not for death and suffering and grief and loss. God's will is not to punish people because of the gays or because of the Democrats or because of who is in the White House or for whatever fantastic reason we come up with for this virus wars and viruses and pandemics and disasters happen they're not God's will for us God's will for us is grace and hope and life and peace years ago I heard the story of the young minister who went to her first church and it was out in the country somewhere and like many ministers, she set the goal of going out and visiting all the members she could over the first couple of months that she was there. And she managed to meet most of the people, but there was one family that she couldn't get in touch with. She would call and they would not respond. And she'd ask people about that and they would say, oh, don't worry about them. Just, you know, hands off them. And it bothered her, so... Finally, she called, and she made an appointment to go out. And She went to the house and sat down with the, the woman, and they sat there in the kitchen, and they drank coffee, and they talked about this, and they talked about that. And then the woman said to the minister, well, the reason we don't go to church anymore is because two years ago I was home vacuuming, and our little boy was playing in the living room. And it seemed only a minute or two, but I turned around and he was gone. And I followed his trail of toys out the door and back into the backyard and to the pool where I found his body. So there it was. There on the table. Would the minister touch it? She did. She expressed her condolences to the woman and expressed her hopes and prayers for them. And the woman said, well, that's all in good, but everybody told us it was God's will. Everybody told us that we should just accept it. And the minister looked at her and she said, that's not God's will. God does not will death. God does not will punishment. God does not will suffering. God wills hope and grace and love and peace for all of us so that we can live through the days which we are given. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.
I give thanks for the way people continue to support the ministries and missions of this church to allow us to be able to put out this kind of worship service each week. And special thanks, as always, to Alex for his technological skills as well as his enthusiasm and his music. So I hope that you'll continue to send in your tithes and gifts to the church. And let me pray a prayer of dedication on them. Abandoned by hope, forsaken by others, left behind by those who said they love them. There are all orphans all around us, holy God. And so may the gifts we offer be a home, a family, a rest, a respite for them and all the others around us. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. When it doesn't seem to do any good, Creator God, we dare to be your people, to love those the world would have us reject, to be just in the face of every reason to mistreat, to be unafraid of whatever awaits us. When all the odds seem stacked against us, Jesus, our Savior, we dare to live as your sisters and brothers, serving others with our hands and hearts, sharing in the burdens of our world, refusing to leave justice orphaned with no hope. When the wind seems to be knocked out of us by the blows of life, eternal companion, we dare to breathe joy upon those caught in the net of hopelessness, peace unto all the broken places around us, wonder for all those who have lost sight of you. And we know that we can bring our prayers of need and concern to you, and so we lift our world, our nation, our communities, our neighborhoods, to you, O God. We pray for those who are affected by the COVID-19, who are seeking to to recover from the effects of it, for those who are serving in the hospitals and in the nursing homes. We pray especially for those who have died and for their families and friends who continue to mourn and grieve them. We especially pray this day for Mark Coder and his family, for his mother. We pray for all those who continue to care for those who have been forgotten by our world. We pray for those who give to food banks, to those who support ministries that reach out to the homeless and to the hungry. And in the silence of these moments, O God, we would lift up our prayers of need and concern that we can only speak to you. In you we dare to live and breathe and be God and community, holy and one. Even as we pray, as we are taught, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this daily, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And our concluding hymn is hymn number 369. I'm going to live so God can use me. i
the peace of the silent mountains, the peace of the singing stars, and the deep, deep peace of the Prince of Peace be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>